All right, good. Um, my name is uh, Remy Peterson. I'm the head of the Danish Coastal Rescue Service, and uh, I'm also the uh, appointed European Regional Development Group coordinator with the RMRF. Um, I was uh, asked to give a presentation uh, on how to specify the ultimate craft. Um, now that's a bit daring in this room. Um, so I kind of put in a, a sub uh, headline saying, well, for our use anyway. And what we did um, is uh, what I'm going to go through with, uh, with this presentation. And I do hope that the manufacturers, uh, Maritime Partner and uh, Zodiac Hurricane, um, if they're here, uh, will, you know, uh, help me do this. Um, first, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to what the Danish Coastal Rescue Service is. And basically, we're made out of three uh, components. We have our buildings, we have our equipment, which is boats and communication stuff, and then obviously we have our crew. Um, this is like the fire triangle, you know, where you need heat, um, fuel and uh, oxygen. And if you remove one of those three, you won't get fire. Well, this is the same thing. You remove one of these things, you will not get a Coastal Rescue Service. Obviously, it's very difficult without the crew but it's also very difficult without the equipment. Um, this is the area that we cover. Um, it's Denmark. Um, it used to be bigger in the old days, um, but um, it's not anymore. Um, <laughs> we're quite content though, still. Um, as you can see, we have uh, 21 lifeboat stations. They're scattered around the Danish coastline, mostly in the uh, western part, which is where we have the foulest weather and obviously the foulest sea. Um, and on average, we do 400 life-saving operations a year. Uh, we do 400 uh, assistance operations. These are typically where people run out of wind. Uh, they get things in their propellers. Uh, they think they're in need of uh, you know, assistance right here and now. Um, and our reaction time from our alert to our first unit away is uh, approximately eight minutes. Uh, this is fairly good considering we do not have uh, crews on the stations 24 hours a day. Uh, they actually live uh, in the community and are on call most of the time. Uh, our equipment availability goals is that we need our lifeboat rescue stations to be available 100% of the time. So that's every day, 24 hours a day. Uh, for our smaller vehicles or vessels, uh, we need those operational 98% of the time. Um, that's a fairly high uh, availability percentage uh, for these kind of vessels because they do take a beating, uh, as you can see in the picture, which I love, by the way. That's a it's not a very good quality here, but it's a, an excellent picture. Um, the history from uh, the Danish Coastal Rescue Service is a long one. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1852, which is equivalent to an nautical mile in meters. Go figure. Um, and um, as you can see, you know, back in the days, this was probably what they would uh, define as a high-speed craft. Um, driven by men made of iron uh, in boats made of wood. Today, boats are made of plastic and aluminium. Uh, go figure. Um, anyways, the drawings went up. Uh, the first engine driven came by in the beginning of the 1900s. Um, and then it slowly developed through the years. Um, and we ended up with what we have today. Um, we did a, a number of um, trials uh, about 20 years ago uh, to figure out how to build a very good craft. And uh, this is what we ended up with. It's not that the process took 20 years, obviously. Um, and we date today we have 21 of these high-speed rescue crafts. Um, they vary in size from uh, 7.5 to 11 meters. Uh, they comply to different rules and regulations, uh, and the speed uh, is around 45 to 47, uh, 35 to 47 knots, and uh, an operating time of at least four hours. Um, we, we consider these our workhorse, and, and we use them for about 70 to 90 percent of all our uh, operations. So, so they have a vast area of, um, of, of, of operations, obviously. Um, some odd 20 years ago, we started developing uh, this one. It's a light rescue boat. Um, this was before the IMO uh, thought of really doing the FRB rule set out. And we needed a vessel uh, that would take care of our crew. So a lot of uh, research and development went into that. And um, actually, the rules and regulations for this craft were made up by our lifeboat crews uh, in cooperation, obviously, with the Danish Maritime Safety Administration um, and the Danish Maritime Authority. Um, we still have these vessels in, in operation today, and they're very capable. Um, at the day, or at the time that they were built, the engines that you, were, uh, you could get 
were fairly small if you wanted solus approved. So we have problems with the engines today because we tend to, you know, spike them up a bit. Um, so they, they they break. Why does this thing keep changing? All right. The next one we did was the uh, Zodiac Hurricane. We did this one uh, in the beginning of 2000. Um, and this was built to standard fast rescue boat uh, guidelines or rule set. Um, and we wanted to do this because we needed a boat where we didn't have to go bespoke all the way. Um, and um, those of you who have been here previous uh, conferences, you may have seen one of these because we've brought one. Um, it's a very capable boat. Um, high speed, obviously, dual drivetrain. Um, and we're very happy with it. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make a better boat. And we wanted to specify the ultimate craft for the Danish Coast Rescue Service. Um, we had about 30 years of experience on how to build these boats, or how to drive them anyways. So we knew pretty much what we wanted. Um, and we knew what we was going to use them for, which was life-saving coastal rescues and assistance. Uh, when were we going to do this? We were going to do it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and 365 days a year. In all but the most severe weather conditions. Um, where? Well, pretty much in area A1, which is about 25 miles off the coast. Um, and in unprotected waters, which is the North Sea in Skagerrak, uh, where we 80% of the time experience Sea State 5. Um, and in semi-protected waters, which is Kattegat in the Baltic Sea, uh, where we 80% of the time experience Sea State 3. Uh, and we would have to go to both shallow and deep water. Secondly, we wanted to combine the experience and knowledge that we got from our previous builds. Obviously, that would make good sense. Uh, both from the light rescue boat and the fast rescue boat, remove the trimmings and, and just find out what was really the core. And we found out that our minimum requirements for this build would be four hours of continuous usage in sea state three at a minimum 40 knots. Uh, we didn't care too much to have a top speed of 60 knots if you're only capable of doing an absolute calm weather, um, because we do know that 80% of the time we'll be going out in meter waves. So we wanted it at sea state three. Um, we wanted it to be able to do that with a crew of four, uh, which is set at 400 kilos. Now, normally the, the standard weight is 75, but if you look in that corner, I have two of my crew members, and um, they're rather bulky. So um, we set it up to, uh, to 400 kilos. Um, the hull, well, the first one we built was built out of composite, and we've loved it for a, a number of years. Um, the Hurricane boat, which is also a very good boat, was built out of aluminium. So we didn't really care too much whether it was composite or aluminium. Obviously, there are advantages and disadvantages with both. Um, we found out that we wanted semi-foam-filled fenders, or we wanted completely foam-filled fenders. Um, this is mainly due to when you navigate in debris. We didn't want to risk cutting up the, uh, the fenders on, a, on, a, on an air tube. Um, we needed backup on all essential equipment. Uh, we've learned that through the years, that so that's a good idea. Uh, on radios, engines, etc. Um, and we wanted easy access to all essential parts. Uh, this is very critical when you're dealing with a, a boat that you need available 80%, 98% of the time. Um, so it should be very easy and very quick to change engines, you know, access the valves and stuff like that. Um, we wanted a high degree of standard parts being used in the build. Uh, obviously, if you have bespoke parts, changing them will be you know, quite strenuous, it'll take time. Um, we wanted a high degree of protection against shock, vibration, and noise. Uh, yeah, I've been to this conference before, which is why we brought this in. Um, and we wanted high protection against the environment. Uh, when you go out on a rescue for an extended period of time <coughs> in, these west in, the <coughs> in these vessels, you want to be able to protect the crew. Um, and we want it to be FRB approved. Um, now, why do we do that? Well. We could have built this boat to the LRB rule set that we had, the regulations, which we were very uh, comfortable with. Um, but the thing is, the boat builders don't know that rule set. It's a dangerous rule set. So for us to try and educate them on what that meant uh, would be a very long task. And we were afraid that we wouldn't get any tenders in. So we settled for the FRB, and then we just tweaked it a bit to our needs. Um, those of you who know the FRB rule set also knows that 11 meters is not really an FRB, and you'll need a hoisting point and stuff like that. So we obviously got suspension for that. Other requirements? Well, we needed a high end user involvement in this project. So I wanted the boat crews to be a member of the project, um, to have, you know, be stakeholders so that they will feel that this vessel was their own. Oh, sorry. Um, 
And we wanted the, uh, the boat builders to bring forth their best ideas. Uh, we're not boat builders, we're users. Um, so we didn't know what kind of uh, mad ideas that people have lying around in their drawers or shelves. So we wanted them to come to us with those ideas. Um, and this is what we ended up with, which is pretty much a sp bespoke hybrid between the uh, fast rescue boat and the uh, light rescue boat. It's built by Maritime Partner. It uh, has a top speed of more than 40 knots, and we'll quite happily do uh, that for four hours in Sea State 3. Um, we have been driving this boat uh, at around 30, 35 knots in, in two and a half meter waves, so, so it works really well without you know, destroying the crew, obviously. Um, there's a backup on all essential equipment and systems. It's uh, a low degree of maintenance, and it's very easy to access, um, and it is FRB approved. So in all basic needs, it's, it fulfills what we thought would be the ultimate craft. And right now it is. Um, what happens in 10 years, no, you know, no one knows. Um, I would think that we probably won't be looking at a higher speed, because 40 knots is actually pretty good. But we will probably be looking at maybe wanting to negotiate that speed in higher sea states. So in sea state 4, maybe. Because obviously, if we experience this or less in 80% of the time, then in 20% of the time we experience worse weather. Um, so we might want to be able to narrow the gap from where we need to go from, from this boat to our lifeboats. Um, as I said, I'm also the uh, European Regional Development Group Coordinator for the RMRF. And I just want to show you this slide, uh, just to tell you a little bit about what the RMRF stands for, what we do. And right now we're working on the rescue boat guidelines, which is uh, managed by a project leader from the RNLI. Uh, we have a mass rescue. There's a conference here in June. It's going to be here in, in Gothenburg. Uh, we have a European exchange program where eight nations are going together and trying to develop uh, an exchange program on how to train and, and operate. Uh, there's a communications product trying to make the RMRF more known. Um, what I was hoping to do now is because obviously this is, says thank you and I think I'm a bit ahead of time. But what I was hoping to do is, is maybe get the boat builders, if there's anyone from Hurricane and Maritime Partner, to try and explain what they did from their end. Um, because we had some requirements, and, and that's easy. It's very easy to, to put out requirements. But for a, for a boat builder to... Okay. Um, for a boat builder to actually acknowledge those and, and put it into a vessel, uh, is, is a bit more complicated than such. Um, and obviously, I hope some of you, uh, you know, took my advice earlier and went down and saw the boat, which is down in the harbor. Um, so if there are anyone who has comments or questions on how we did this and how we would do it in the future, now's the time.